Welcome to DeFi 101. If you saw the pilot to this series, which was Impermanent Loss, you'll know that we're digging into the core concepts behind DeFi. And in this series, you'll learn all about DeFi in under two minutes in 30 videos with topics spanning dApps, smart contracts, lending, borrowing, trading, trust intermediaries, censorship, P2P wallets, and all that good stuff. So buckle up, lean back. This is DeFi 101. DApps, or decentralized applications, are applications powered by a blockchain protocol like Ethereum. When you build a DApp on Ethereum, you're programming a simple set of rules for a DApp to follow when it receives money. Now, smart contracts are a lot like programming a robot. Smart contracts on a blockchain, like the kinds powering the most popular apps in DeFi, are often used for money applications to put their money to work without interacting with an annoying intermediary like, say, a bank teller. The smart contracts are like good robots. Robots that help my money grow by following a strict set of rules programmed on the blockchain. Now, if a blockchain like Ethereum can enable trustless interactions, then smart contracts are the actual middlemen, enabling me to do new and interesting things with money without having to trust humans who've often proven themselves to be untrustworthy. So the takeaway here is, while dApps and smart contracts sound like something that requires a PhD, it's actually just your friendly neighborhood money robot doing exactly as you say, as long as you're willing to pay for the privilege. In DeFi, the possibilities of what can be built to replace legacy finance are endless, but there are a few use cases that every newcomer to DeFi will want to know about and explore early on because one, they're easy to understand, and two, battle-tested with billions in liquidity and hundreds of thousands of users, and three, although we didn't say three, they're easy to use. Now first off, you need to know about stable coins, and these are pretty much exactly what they sound like, a coin that is stable. And if you know your crypto, well, that's something to be valued. And in most cases, that stable coin is pegged to the US dollar. In the future, we'll see more stable coins pegged to other fiat, but for now, USD pegged stable coins are the standard. And you might be surprised to know that there is almost $15 billion in stable coin liquidity currently on Ethereum. That's a lot. Now, stable coins have been a huge breakthrough in DeFi because they allow users to transfer value with a reliable price point versus the highly volatile markets normally found in cryptocurrencies. Next up, we have trading. And in DeFi, trading happens on decentralized exchanges or DEXs. A DEX allows buyers and sellers to agree upon a price and exchange assets. Uniswap is one of the most popular DEXs with over $250 to $500 million in daily trading volume. And the best part of a DEX is traders don't have to trust anyone to hold their assets. So in DeFi, it's a peer-to-peer -peer exchange. You are always in control of your assets. Lastly, we have lending and borrowing. Now, when you go to the bank and borrow money, they ask for you to collateralize two things, your home and your reputation. But in DeFi, we don't have courts to keep borrowers incentivized to follow through with their contract. So what happens instead is we over collateralize. Borrowers deposit more than the value of what they aim to borrow, and lenders know if borrowers fail to maintain their loan, the DeFi app will auto sell their collateral to pay back the lenders. At the end of the day, borrowers pay low interest rates and lenders earn higher interest rates, so it's a win-win. So the takeaway here is, while DeFi essentially mimics the traditional banking world we all grew up with, this is really about a new way of transacting peer-to-peer -peer with no minimums, no signups, no permission required, and no middlemen. Sound radical? Well, it kind of is. And that is why DeFi is so hot right now. Now, there are three major differences to know between CeFi, or centralized finance, and DeFi, or decentralized finance. First, in crypto banking services, centralized finance, you know, like Coinbase, Binance, Huobi, the big boys you've all traded your crypto on, these are owned by a single entity or often a corporation. CeFi teams often provide valuable services, but at the end of the day, they're 100% in charge. They can let you in and they can kick you out. But in DeFi, applications aim to decentralize that ownership and become community owned, kind of like a grocery co-op. Everyone owns a piece of it and its code is run and maintained by the community. 
Now, secondly, in centralized finance, you often have to go through a sign up and submit to KYC or know your customer regulations. And this is often to abide by regulations and prevent criminal behavior like money laundering. But at the end of the day, this is cumbersome and gets in the way, it provides friction. In DeFi, as long as you have a crypto wallet like MetaMask, you don't have to submit to KYC or sign up to anything or ask anyone for permission. Just click connect and you're in. And that's what we mean by DeFi being permissionless, no permission required. In centralized finance, we trust exchanges and other centralized apps with our assets. In fact, we don't really have a choice. If I deposit into Coinbase, I am trusting them to keep the balance of my crypto assets safe while I trade. But in DeFi, I never have to trust anyone. I just custody my own assets. And even if I trade them, it's a peer-to-peer -peer swap where no one else ever takes control of my assets. So I depend on the smart contracts to execute transactions and trades, not people. So the takeaway here is that CeFi and DeFi provide similar services, but centralized finance, CeFi, is better for those of us who prefer to play by highly regulated rules and fill out the paperwork to get in the club that custodies our crypto assets for us, and in doing so gives us permission to participate in their crypto services, but of course also has a helpline, versus in DeFi where we're 100% in control of our assets, trusting the code, which requires no permission, but there's nobody for us to call when something goes wrong. So yes, there's good and bad to consider on both sides, but we'll dig into that more in future DeFi 101 episodes. But for now, at least you know. So you've been watching DeFi 101, do be sure and check out the other videos in this series and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the new videos as they drop. And above all, stay safe out there.